Hey guys, today it is time for a new myth or truth episode. We have quite a few more myths to butts today, all sent in by you guys in the comment section of my videos. If you have myth or truths for me to butts, leave them down below in the comment section and I will do my best to respond to them in future videos before we start. Today's video is of course sponsored by RepotMe.com who offers you everything you could possibly need to properly take care of your orchid. From potting mixes to pots, fertilizers, accessories, you name it, they have it all. And not only for orchids, but also other house plants as well, such as cacti and succulents. So I will link it to their website down below in the description. Feel free to check them out at any time. And I will also link you the products that I personally love the most. Let me, let me just give you a little spoiler. Look what I got. I got the MSU again, woohoo! Okay, future video, we're gonna talk about it. So excited, finally I have the MSU fertilizer. Again, my all time favorite fertilizer. Super happy about it. My co-host today is the wonderful Zygopetalum Lewisendorf. I think it's a commercial name, not sure if it's registered. He smells like hyacinths. And I am very proud because I didn't used to do good with zygos. But now I am, woohoo, excited about that. So I blabbed enough, didn't I? Let's get to the myths or truths, shall we? First potential myth or truth, pests are more likely to be an issue in warmer climates than in colder climates. Is this true or a myth? Well, let me just say it's a myth, simply because I lived in a cooler climate and now I live in a hot climate and the pest issue is the same. Different pest, same issue, <laughs> pretty much. Now, yes, maybe some pests will prefer higher temperature than others, but that's not really what's going on here. Usually summertime, generally, not everywhere, but generally speaking, summertime is a better season for pests because generally that's when the most available food is. In many climates, including the one that I come from, in winter there are no leaves, there's no greenery, everything pretty much dies off. So there is really nothing to eat. So pests, if they would be active, they would have nothing to eat. So they evolved to create this dormant and then active cycle that allows them to survive cooler climates, even though for maybe six months out of the year, they don't have anything to eat. Now, if this cool down doesn't happen, guess what? The pests do not go dormant. I happen to live in an environment where the more plentiful food is in winter. In summertime, everything dries and dies, pretty much becomes a desert. So in winter time, when it actually rains, things are very green. Even so, there are still green plants in the summertime. In this climate, I have pests all year round because they don't need to go dormant. In summertime, they just work faster and many of the plants are stressed in the summer as well. So their defense mechanisms are a little impaired as well if they suffer, if they become dehydrated. So pests take over and many of the times they have that boom in numbers. So there is, I don't want to say some truth to it because there's nothing true about that statement in my opinion. I've had pests in my winter in Romania as well. Oh, more than I can count. But there is a logic of things that Sally got translated into this very weird myth saying that if you keep your plants cool, you won't have piss, which is untrue. Piss become inactive at temperatures much lower than these orchids can withstand. And I really cannot prove it more to you than telling you that I have thrips issues in the middle of winter and this room is cooler than it is in summer, trust me. So yeah, no, that's absolutely not true. And since we're on the subject, it is also not true that if you keep your plant in high humidity, you won't have piss, no, no, absolutely untrue. It's also not true that if you missed your plant, you won't have piss, again, not true. That's a whole different debate there. So all of these articles you see that advertise this really simple way of getting rid of piss are all made to make you click and capitalize on your hope, pretty much. That is my harsh opinion. I wish it were that simple with pests, but it's not. Next up, a myth or truth from Red Dragon. Cat layers cannot be grown in moss. That is obviously false, but as you might already know, I grow my cat layers in full moss with the top layer of bark, but in here we have only moss and it's an opaque pot, but I get away with it due to my climate. Moss is a wonderful medium 
for the right person. And it can also be a horrifying medium for the wrong person. I do believe that your lifestyle in combination with the environment in your grow room plays an important role. Orchids are simple. They don't care about materials you are using as long as they one, allow for water to reach the root system, two, allow proper aeration around the root system, and three, the environment around the root system is not damaging both physically and chemically. And here in this section, I will include also the pH problem if it's too high, the nutrient absorption, it's impaired and so on and so forth. But these are the simplest three rules that orchids are adapted to quote unquote like. From here on, it is up to the imagination. As you will see, I will have another myth or truth about the potting medium. And honestly, it doesn't really matter what orchid we are talking about because the good thing about all of these potting mixes we use is that we can control them if we know how to use them. And sphagnum moss, in my opinion, is super controllable, starting with how you pack it in the pot and ending with how you water it, the pot you're using with it, and so on and so forth. If you know how to handle it, if you go through that learning curve, everything is absolutely fine. It does require a learning curve, so it's easy to do mistakes with sphagnum moss. And that's why personally, I just don't recommend it to beginners. I think you're much safer to start with bark. Even if it's not gonna be the perfect medium for you, it will teach you a lot of things at least. And then maybe if you feel like sphagnum moss might be a good option for you, then by all means, go ahead. It is a wonderful medium because it provides moisture or allows for moisture. It allows for air and it's not in any way damaging to the roots. Why wouldn't it work? So yeah, cattleyas do absolutely fine in sphagnum moss if the sphagnum moss has synergy with the grower and the environment. Next up, myth or truth from Patsy. Once the Tulumnia fan blooms, it will never bloom again. I will go ahead and say that is false simply because there is no nuance in that statement. There is a part of it that is true, but I did have some surprises with my Tulumnias. So I just want to show off this beautiful little thing here. This is my Tulumnia Gyrac firm or flyer, it's flyer, goals. And it has the most beautiful magenta color to it. I think it contrasts so well with my shirt. Anyway, so here's the thing. Tulumnias are sympodial orchids. Yes, they have fans. They look a little bit like Vandas, but actually they work more like Oncidiums. They have a rhizome and each fan is produced on that rhizome. And as you might know with these sympodials, once a pseudobulb blooms, it will not bloom again. The nuance is that very old fans, which already bloomed, will not bloom again once we have a fully mature fan blooming. That is 99.99999% the, the case with these orchids, including Tulumnias. But if the fan is relatively new in the sense that it just bloomed and lost its blooms and we don't have a newer fan on that rhizome that is completely mature, ready to bloom as well, this fan can actually bloom again and I've had it happen to me. So let's take this fan, it has this flower spike, it is in full bloom, but I don't have a new fan even growing from here yet. So once the blooms here fall, this fan can actually start to put out another flower spike from the other side if it so desires, because it is still the newest mature fan. And if it wants to bloom again, it can bloom again. And it's not uncommon. It can sometimes happen and it happens with Oncidiums as well. I actually have an Oncidium to show you. I know this question is not about Oncidiums, but they work in the very same way. Hold on. All right, so here we have a very untidy lava burst. I need to get to it. We can see that the flower spikes it had like a couple of months ago are already spent, but we have some more flower spikes here. These are not coming from new pseudobulbs. They're actually coming, and I'm gonna give you close-ups, they're coming from the very same pseudobulbs, but from the other side. So once the flowers dropped on this orchid, it decided, hey, I still have some space for some flower spikes, why not? Tis the season. So it put out another set of flower spikes from the very same pseudobulbs. And that's just because the pseudobulbs are mature, but fairly new, and there is no newer pseudobulb able to bloom at the moment. So this can definitely happen, but if there will be a new growth starting from here and almost being mature, no, the older pseudobulbs will not put out flowers in, again, 99.99999% of the cases. 
And this is the case with telumnias and many, many, many other sympodial orchids. Cattleyas, not so much because they bloom from a terminal spike. They don't have multiple growth points that are capable of blooming. They just have that one. So if it blooms once, it's done that particular cane, uh, but everything from Oncidiums and its relatives like Miltonias, Miltoniopsis and so on, to Tolumnias and Bulbophyllums and other Sympodials, they can definitely do that. Next up, myth or truth. If you cut or break a flower spike before it has buds, the plant will immediately start a new one. I really, really wish this were true, but it's actually false. Now, before you start commenting, yes, it happens, but more often than not, or with more orchids than not, it's not gonna happen. With zygos, it doesn't happen. If you break this flower spike, doubtful it will create a new one because flower spikes are produced by immature growths. So the plant is actually kind of working double and I doubt it will have the energy to put out another flower spike because the flower spike actually grows together with a tiny plant or tiny new growth. Now the growth is not so tiny anymore, it's consuming a lot of energy while the flower spike stopped consuming energy. There is a way of doing things with these orchids. Cattleyas, again, no, you break the flower spike, there's no more growth point up there. Um, what else? Paphiopetalums, no, you break the flower spike, it's done. Fandas, break the flower spike, Doubtful it will put out immediately another flower spike, but with stuff like Phalaenopsis, yes, it does actually happen if you're still in the cool period. Yes, it can almost immediately put out a new flower spike. And when I say immediate, I say like a couple of weeks. <laughs> um, what else? Oncidiums can definitely do that. But it really, really depends on circumstance, on environment, on the type of orchid first and foremost, that you have. With the Tulumnia, it could happen. Phalaenopsis do it a lot, actually. But with many other stuff like zygos and paths and stuff, no, it definitely does not happen because there is only one growth point. And even if the orchid would like or would have the energy to produce another flower spike, it simply doesn't have a growth point or a space for it. We have to wait for a new growth to mature. If you have fouls, though, they can do that a lot. So don't lose hope. Next up, myth or truth, this is a series from Raka Sheath, our most active myth or truther. <laughs> uh, myth or truth, all red color flowering orchids will show reddish pigmentation on their leaves and stem. False, actually that is false. And yes, it happens a lot when you have a redder, let's say Phalaenopsis to have some red pigmentation on the foliage as well. Let me just get one to show you as an example if you missed when I showed it initially. Here we go, this is my mislabeled orchid. Remember I used to tell you that this is not money, it is Cornocervi speciosa. It might actually be Mani speciosa. Not entirely sure, speciosa hybrid, let's call it like that. This one, as you can see, it's very red. The flower spikes turned red, the flowers are a very deep red, the foliage has a lot of red freckles and anthocyanin patches. This is a red, red plant altogether. But here we have a cattleya, which is very magenta. In the world of plants, magenta is also caused by anthocyanin. But as you can see, this orchid has no red on it and I am keeping it under pretty bright light. I have cattleyas which do turn red, which are red, but also some cattleyas which are red or purple, which don't turn red or purple. It is all about genetics. And yes, even though many of the times anthocyanin present on the foliage typically is linked to an orchid that has a lot of anthocyanin in its flowers as well, it's not a rule written in stone. You can always have surprises. But, and especially with Phalaenopsis, I do see that there is more of a connection. Usually Phalaenopsis with reddish purplish blooms tend to have more anthocyanin on the leaves as well. And Phalaenopsis that are white or yellow tend to have much less anthocyanin on the leaves. But with other orchids, it doesn't really work like that. So we cannot really make a general rule out of things. Next up, misting or spraying water on orchid flowers will cause them to wilt or rot. Again, because of the nuance and how the sentence is formulated, uh, I will have to say false. Yes, I know that many of the times I tell you guys, do not put water on the flowers, do not mist your flowers, it can cause botrytis, it can also lead to faster wilting if that fungal infection spreads. Yeah, you guys know I insist on that. Well, 
We cannot generalize it because yet again, orchids are different, their flowers are different, and typically orchids that have thicker, waxier flowers are much more resistant to botrytis than, let's say, a Phalaenopsis with one of those very flimsy flowers. I think even my Zygopetalum would be okay if I misted the flowers because the petals are pretty waxy and pretty thick. Now, would I suggest you spray your flowers? No, I would not. Even if it's outside where water evaporates faster, you never know. If you got that spore of that fungus that is just right, yeah, you can have some blemishes on the flowers. And I don't want you guys to have blemishes on the flowers. We wait a lot of time for these flowers. So if you can avoid water on the flowers, do so. But it doesn't necessarily mean that if you have some droplets of water, they will immediately have botrytis and wilt. Really depends on the orchid, really depends on the bacterial or pathogen environment in the air in that specific moment. Depends how fast the water evaporates. I don't know if I said that already. Depends on many things, just don't do it. But it's not a rule written in stone yet again. As you might see, I'm very literal <laughs> about this. If I cannot generalize something, even though it happens in a vast majority of cases, I don't wanna say it's true. Anyway, so <laughs> let's move on. This is a good one. Donna is saying, well, Donna is asking a question, but I will make it into a myth or truth. So, myth or truth. Wine corks can be used as orchid potting medium. True, it absolutely is true. And that's just because you can use as a potting medium whatever crosses your mind that fulfills the three rules that I spoke about earlier, the three golden rules. Does it allow for water? Does it allow for air around the roots? And also, is it physically or chemically damaging? Cork fulfills all of those three rules. Hence, you can. You can put your orchids in wine corks. You can put your orchids in Lego pieces. <laughs> Feel like you can put your orchids in anything you can imagine. Now, will it be easy to maintain an orchid in such a potting mix? Well, I will debate on that. I, I will be very reserved on having to water my orchid multiple times a day in wine corks. But if you can make it work, you can use wine corks. Of course you can. Oh, by the way, this mainly applies to epiphytic, not terrestrials. I would not put a jewel orchid or even a paphiopetalum in wine corks because those roots are really allergic to air. If there is too much air and not enough humidity, they will just dry and stop growing. But see, these are semi-terrestrial or terrestrial orchids. So what I'm saying now, applies to Phalaenopsis, Cattleyas, Dendrobiums, Oncidium, everything that is actually epiphytic and should not be in soil. Everything that is terrestrial, let's forget about. But yeah, you guys, have you grown orchids and wine corks? <laughs> How is that working for you? How many times a day do you need to water? Or maybe you can just shower them down. Maybe you have them in your greenhouse or outdoor growing areas. That, that can actually work out. So with that said, thank you guys so much for watching. Hope you've enjoyed today's video. Thank you, Repodme, for sponsoring yet another myth or truth. And keep those myths coming down below in the comment section. So I hope you all have a great day. With that said, I'll see you next time. Bye.